He'll be all right. He's going to have to be. He doesn't have a choice. <laughs> Hi everyone, we are live on the Frugal Crafter YouTube channel. I'm Lindsay the Frugal Crafter and with me in the studio today is Sarah. Hi! And we are going to be doing this uh, rainy scene and I've got the photograph right here although it's just printed on copy paper so it's not the best quality. However, you can find a link to this photo in the video description and you can uh, pull it up on your computer screen if you want to um, and that way you'll have the actual image to go by and then you can kind of follow along. You can watch us through, ask questions as we go, chat with your friends in the chat here live on YouTube and paint it later if you want to because sometimes it's a little easier once you've seen the whole process to go and paint it on your own. If you have any questions as we're going along we have some fabulous moderators that can help you out and if it's a question that um, needs my attention Sarah will relay it to me. When you have a question type the word question in all caps then type your question in normal upper and lowercase letters and that way YouTube won't boot you out thinking it's spam that way we'll actually see your comment and uh, we can get you the help you need we are gonna start off by wetting the back of our watercolor paper now when I did this this is just on the 6x9 inexpensive aqua bee paper I didn't draw anything on there I just went right to town with the paint um, I did put a few guidelines on this for myself just so I could uh, wouldn't have to stop and think as much as I did here um, but you can go right in with a plain piece of paper what you want to do though is wet the back really well and I'm just going to use a spray bottle to help me with that and because we're going to be wetting the back and the front of the paper it's going to keep it from wrinkling so you don't need to tape it down so that's uh that's kind of handy uh, oh my brush isn't very clean luckily this is the back <laughs> you want it and it's going to come a suction to your table I like to have like a silicone mat or teflon mat or a piece of plexiglass or glass or something don't do this right on your wood table or you could damage it because sometimes water damages uh, wood, especially a sopping wet puddle on a prolonged amount of time like we're going to have today. So you basically just want to make sure everything is glossy wet. You have any questions so far? Caught up for the moment. Awesome. I saw there was a lot of people waiting before the stream, so that was really exciting to see so many familiar faces hanging out. Just make sure you get the whole thing wet. You can tip it to the light, then that way any spots that are dry won't be shiny and you'll be able to spot them really well. All right, I listed the colors that we're going to be using in the video description and I'll mention them as we go along. Um, I'm going to start off with some Payne's Gray. And I've got my, I'm using the lid to my core watercolor tin and because there's so many little dimples on it, my my um, little pans that have just have little magnets on the back want to jump around on me, so... I apologize for that. And I'm going to put a little bit of uh, cerulean blue in there. And the reason I'm using cerulean is because it's um, it's kind of granular and it's going to mix with the Payne's Gray. It'll make it'll give it a little bit more texture because Payne's Gray doesn't have that much texture on its own. So it'll just kind of help it out there. And I'm going to start right across the top of the paper and just kind of bring that color down. So you can kind of see how we're just getting a little bit of texture up there because of the quality of the cerulean blue. You could also take burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and make your gray that way and do the same thing. I'm also going to take some of this color and add it into my street. <clears throat> because I made little indications on here where my headlights are going to be um, kind of reflecting, I'm going to go around that. But if you if you don't have that much of an idea yet, don't worry. This paper is going to stay wet because we've wet the back as well as the front. And, um, and then you'll just be able to lift it off where you need to. This is a cotton paper, but it's a very inexpensive cotton paper. It's the um, Strathmore Ready Cut, and it's like $7.30 for a 10-pack, so for 8x10. So it's really, if you want to try cotton paper, but you're not ready to invest uh, in a full sheet of something, it's a nice option. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some other colors. I think I'll take some of the Payne's Gray and some Burnt Sienna. Now I want to keep some edges here so I'm not going to have this as wet. If you look it's kind of like a heavy cream consistency. It's not as watery like we had skim milk and now we've got, um, we've got heavy cream. And I'm going to go in and just kind of put in some of my, my buildings here. Just long strokes with this big brush. If you feel like you're getting too much paint, um, you can switch to a flat brush because a flat brush will not carry quite as much. 
I'm gonna grab a little bit of cadmium red and a little bit of burnt sienna. And the reason why I picked cadmium red is because it's so indicative of those Chinese lanterns. And also it's a heavy color and it doesn't flow as much. So it's going to kind of stay where we put it a little bit easier as we're doing these, pro these uh, buildings and the different things in the wet into wet technique. Put some of that over here as well. So I'm not putting much water into my paint here because I because I want to control how far it spreads. Uh, Stacy Brister, does Lindsay like this paper better than the B paper? Uh, I like the B paper better, quite frankly, but it's a little smaller. So the B paper is only six inches by nine inches. Although I haven't bit the bullet yet, but I did see on Amazon, they have it in the 22 inch by 30 sheets. Um, but it, it's not as, it doesn't seem like it's as good as a deal as the pack of the, um, six by nines. And I do have quite a bit of, uh, full sheet watercolor cotton paper from other brands currently. So, um, so I haven't, uh, I haven't tried that yet, but I think I, I like the B paper a little bit better. I like the texture on it. I find one side of the Canson, um, I mean, of the Strathmore Ready Cut has a beautiful texture and one side is kind of like very mechanical looking. It's not as pretty. It looks very much like their kind of cheaper student grade ones. And I just don't like that, that kind of, it looks like somebody ran a tonka truck all over it. So <laughs> it's just got that, you know, very uniform machine made texture that I don't care for. Now we have a lot of different buildings and signs and things going on here. So I don't want to paint all that in, but I do want to give the indication of some of those textures. So I'm going to switch to a brush. It's not as absorbent. I'm just going to grab the synthetic um, golden tackle on brush and I'm going to grab some yellow. This is, um, I believe it's cadmium yellow. Let me double check. A uh, diorolide, diorolide yellow actually, um, but you can use cad yellow, Indian yellow, gamboge. Gamboge would be really good because it's a little bit more opaque than Indian yellow. Uh, and I'm just gonna throw in, these lines will represent um, lights on in windows, lit up neon signs, that sort of thing. It'll give us life to our, to our city streets. And I'm going back and forth looking at the um, the scene that I painted and the scene, the, the photograph that, that I have, because a lot of this is we're painting um, what it look, what it feels like more than what it looks like. Kind of feel like everything is just wet and rainy. Under this awning, I want to get quite a bit of light. Now there's like a nasty old dumpster or something it looks like here. So I don't want to put that in there, but luckily there's some pretty lens flare, like little bokeh effect happening from the photographer. Um, and I love that. So I decided that that is a great way to add some interest. Keep this dark over here and add some interest. I'm going to grab some red before things start to dry out and throw in just indications of some signs and banners. Let's put a sign right there. Maybe one back there. So things get smaller as they get further away. So kind of keep that in mind. And I'm just doing kind of like, um, just, just shapes, like almost like stained glass shapes, just chunks of color and light here and there. You want a nice rhythm. Something I really liked and the photograph was this little awning sticking out here, which I later went in and just kind of caught the edges with some pen to make it stand out. So I did uh, leave that. I did draw that just to make sure I could um, avoid painting over that. Now I'm going to go in with some paints way darker and get that really wet street here. Um, I want to get some shadow here from the tires going down the road under these cars. And if anything is really, um, uh, really bright white, we can always go in with a pen. We can lift off while things are wet. Like I'm just kind of going around my tire, my headlight reflections that I'll be adding later. out the edge of that car a little bit. 
by painting around it. I think I want to keep this angle here that kind of goes off the paper, not quite at the corner. You want it a little bit above the corner, otherwise it will kind of stop your eye. And I'm just going to pull that dark in from there. I also wanted some nice reflections on the glossy road, so I'm going to throw in some of the, the nice red, the cadmium red. And you might need to clean your brush if you find you're picking up too much of your other color. Just wash your brush, rinse it out, pick up some fresh color and go from there. I'm going to lift out a little bit of the color back there. Maybe put in a little bit of yellow, which I don't see in the photograph, but I feel, but it feels like it needs a little there because I've had that yellow up there. Uh, Kendall McCauley, when painting soft ripples in water, as in a smooth sea, is the shadow underneath each ripple? I've been studying pictures, but I'm having a hard time figuring it out. Um, so when you're painting the ripples in the water is a shadow, usually um, you get the highlight on the top of the ripple or whatever f plane of the ripple is facing the sky. So generally, generally, yeah, it's you, it's not even so much as it, as it's a shadow, it's more like the water is clear. It's not, you're not getting the bounce of the light off of it. So instead of, it's not so much a shadow as it is, you're seeing a reflection or you're, I'm sorry, no, you're seeing through the water as opposed to seeing the reflection of the sky, you're seeing through the water and you're seeing like, if it's, you know, a Caribbean ocean, you're seeing that bright blue turquoise because it's the light bouncing off the, bouncing off the, um, uh, the sand and reflecting some of the sky or absorbing some of the sky color. And the, then the crested wave would be the reflection of the light. And you would, that would be your kind of where you'd see the color versus the white. And if it was like a pond, you might see kind of like a murky brownish greenish, um, color because you're seeing down through the water to down to the floor of the pond or as far as the light will go um, and then on the top you're seeing a reflection of the sky or the trees around it or whatever is reflecting in the in the um, surface facing the light I hope that makes sense I probably didn't explain it very well um, taking some of this blue and throwing some of this uh, cerulean blue on its own in a few places It seems kind of weird, but there is so much color in um, on a rainy day. You see so much of it. I'm just blocking in these little cars that are over here. I think they're parked. It looks more like they're parked along the street than they're actually moving. Uh, Clary's K. Clary's K. Is the Canson Montville like cotton watercolor paper? I'm unsure of the quality and I would like to purchase a roll. Um, the cotton, the Canson Montville is, if you've ever used the Cotman paper by Winsor Newton, it's very much like that. Um, it's, it's got a beautiful texture. It's not very heavily sized. So just kind of keep that in mind. Lifting back can be an issue. Um, oh wait, you know what? I'm sorry. I was thinking about Cotman, not the Montville. The Montville is quite heavily sized. Um, they're, Cold press is fa is fairly smooth. I'd smoother than a lot of cold presses, and their rough is more like the cold press that you're probably used to. Um, I like it. I think it's pretty robust. Um, it, it will dry a little unevenly if you're doing like really big wet washes because it is a, a um, wood pulp paper. But yeah, I actually use it in my for like loose florals. I used I recommended it for my loose floral watercolor class because of those properties. Because the uh, the paint would glide along the surface and um, it's good with student grade colors because the paint stays on top of the surface and it doesn't seep in so you get that brighter that brighter color i think it's a good value and you can get blocks of it too for much less than like blocks of you know cotton paper just uh making sure my lines that are going straight down are um vertical they're not like tipping 
So what you put down for, for colors and strokes, try to make them intentional and not just put something willy nilly, you know, try to give it a reason why you're putting it there. Like I'm going to put some dark here so that awning will stand out a little bit more. I'm so glad I did a practice one first because it, it is difficult to talk and paint this at the same time <laughs> <laughs> to make these decisions and try to talk at the same time is, is tough. I'm bringing up some darks in here because this is a pretty dark area and I want my uh, kind of lens flare to stand out. i mellow it out with a little bit of yellow ochre. Now even though the headlights look very, they're, they're pretty much white, um, I want that, I want the warmth of the light of the headlights so I'm going to use a little bit of the um, warm yellow that we have here. I'm going to put that in the headlights and in the reflections. It's not there, but I but I like it. And so I'm making the choice to put it in there. Uh, Madhuri Bala, I am new to watercolor and my wet on wet technique always becomes a bit muddy after drying. What am I doing wrong? Um, you're probably, it's probably a couple things. Um, you're probably not using quite enough paint when you go in. You're probably, you know, accounting for the shift that you're going to have when it dries where it gets a lot lighter. Um, if you're using a lot of colors that have white in them or student grade colors, they'll kind of get a little muddy as they dry. So you might want to just make sure you're using nice pure colors. Uh, you could be mixing too much on your palette versus just letting it mix on the paper. Um, so there's a bunch of different, a bunch of different reasons that that could be. Oh, and while this is still wet, I want to put in my, um, my lines for the, um, for the lanterns. I'm going to do that with a, um, with the back of my brush. So I actually scribe the paper. And lift out a little bit here. I'm going to start my first lantern up there. Get a little scrubby brush. Just go in a circle like that. You can lift up your color. So the rows of these lanterns are going to get smaller as they go away. So this is going to, these are going to be our most detailed ones. So you want to make them nice and Pretty big, about the size of a, on an eight by ten piece of paper. So these are going to be about the size of a quarter, a quarter coin. Like the next one will be like the size of a nickel, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, Trudy Carande, do you like line and wash technique? Yeah, I do. I don't do it that much um, because I. Uh, we're going to use the ink at the end here. I prefer to, to go to keep it just to watercolor most of the time, but occasionally I do. And, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's nice. So I'm going to have some of these overlapping each other. I made my, my rows closer together on this one that I did on my other one. I'm noticing. We're going to have more lanterns on this one. And you don't need to really lift the ones too far back, just the mainly the ones that you want to really stand out. And use a synthetic brush to paint them in so you don't end up with too much, um, with too much bleeding. So if you can see my brush, hopefully you can see that, you can see the paint standing up on the brush. That's because I don't have a lot of water in it, and it's, so it's not going to feather out too much on me. I'm going to go do all my reds and I'm going to sneak in some of the yellow for a highlight. By choosing colors that lift easily, like our cadmiums um, and that cerulean and our, you know, our two yellows, that gives us a little bit of kind of um, a chance to change our mind if we need to or lift something off if we want to. 
or if we use like transparent colors, um, we'd be able to see everything that was underneath and we could end up with issues where we're not able to correct. I wish I didn't put these so close together, but once you put the lines down, you kind of have to have to dangle them from where the lines are or it won't, wouldn't make sense. We'll go to a round brush just so I have a little more control. And I'm going to go with a synthetic round just so that it doesn't grab too much color. I have one handy here. Oh, I don't have, well, actually, I have my acrylic paint brushes. I'll grab one of those. And they're all synthetic, but I'm, when I say synthetic, I mean like a tacklon or a nylon brush. It's just not going to hold quite as much stuff. Does, uh, Stacy Brister, does Lindsay like the Turner watercolors better than the Lucas 1862 paints? I do prefer the Turners. They're a little bit cleaner, like a little bit clearer looking. Um, I like the, the Lucas have a little bit more granulation, so it, it kind of just depends. I think I'm more used to the Turners. That could be why I have that preference. They're both, they're both great deals. I would say if you have a color that you know you want to granulate a lot, I would go with the, uh, with the Lucas, like a cobalt teal. That's beautiful in the Lucas. Um, any of those uh, granulating greens, earth tone greens are beautiful in the Lucas. Um, but, it, but if you're looking for colors like um, your really bright staining, transparent colors, I would get those in the Turner because you're going to have even more luminosity there. Um, the, the, the Lucas colors definitely have more of a um, body to them. And if you're using them really diluted, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I think they don't contain, they might not have ox gall in them. They, they definitely don't feel as luminous as and transparent as some of the other colors. They have more of a grit. Oh, grit's not the right word either. They just have more of like a body to them, I guess, would be the... All right, I do not like my lanterns here as much as I like them here. So just to give you a... Just to give you a little bit of a comparison there, but that's all right. Not a, everything's not going to be the same every time. Uh, I'm going to grab a little bit of blue here. My paper is starting to dry. Now, I just want to make sure this card does not just dissolve and um, and melt into everything else. That's why I waited till last so the paper would set up a little bit. And my paint, look how thick my paint is. I'm gonna switch to a flat brush just because the car is much more angular, so I want to make sure that I'm making just, I'm not fussing around with it too much and I'm giving it nice angular shapes. And anything we have reflected on the sides would also bounce off like the hood of the car, so we could have a white, um, sorry, a red reflection where it gets the, the light from the sides of the buildings. Maybe even from some of those lanterns because they almost appear to be lit up. They're so bright. I think they are lit up because you can see in the photograph here how bright the, you got one that's not bright, but all these other ones are bright. So it makes me think that these are probably lit because every once in a while you see a dark one and they all appear to be the same material. So it would stand to reason that they're just, you know, the, the bulb blew out on that one. I'm going to dilute some of this Payne's Gray, maybe cool it, uh, warm it up a little bit with some burnt, leftover burnt sienna and fill in this great area because then I can go in with the darker, um, with just Payne's Gray on its own after it dries and I can go put the detail in for the little insignia there. Do the same on the windshield. A little bit more yellow.
little yellow bouncing on this side of the car since we have so many light lit up yellow things over here. Uh, Jenny, are brushes with other names also considered flat brushes, i.e. shader, chisel brush, one stroke, and a short flat wash brush? Sure, yeah, they are. Uh, generally, a one stroke has longer bristles, um, a bright has shorter bristles. Uh, so there's just tiny little, they're all, but flat would be like the flat ferrule. Even an angle, I mean, an angle is technically a flat brush. It's just got ang angled bristles. Getting some of this darker shadow right in front of the car because there are lights coming from the cars behind. You're going to see sh you're going to see highlights under the car um, from the headlights from behind, from other things on the street getting bounced around. But you're going to see this kind of like shadow in front of the tires and in front of the the car. Uh, Elizabeth Eddie, what do you think of Holman paints? Um, I like them fine. They don't have oxgall, so they don't flow quite as much. There are some really good deals. If you check Amazon, there's like, you can get sets of them. There's a set of, um, it must be darn near their entire range of like 60 tubes for $120, which I think is a pretty great deal if you want that many colors. I picked up the set of 18 tubes there for $32 to review a couple of years ago. I still think they have that deal going and that's kind of a nice um, a nice way to try them. The only thing I didn't like about that set is that there were an awful lot of um, mixed colors that I thought, you know, were kind of muddy. Uh, not really muddy, but they would have been so much brighter if, instead of doing that if they had just put in the, um, you know, the single pigment colors, but I'm sure they do kind of like a variety of ones that they think are going to be the most popular and useful together, but I would have probably had enjoyed maybe buying them individually and just getting the color that I knew I was going to use. I want to put some of those uh, red tones in these parked cars as well. Now the nice thing about a project like this is that you can't fuss around too much. You have to keep um, you have to keep painting or you're going to lose, the paper's going to dry on you and you're going to lose kind of that sweet spot time to paint to get your colors down. Now I can start to put in some details. I'm going to use some of this red and do this like a little sign right there, round sign, which I think that's an interesting shape. It mimics the uh, hanging um, lanterns and it will also mimic the lens flare that I'm going to put in at the end. So I want to go and get that in. Don't worry uh, if you've stuffed too too soft because we will be adding um, adding stuff later. What was that? Uh, Jenny, do the bright chisel shaders hold a lot of water compared to a brush just called a flat brush? Flat would hold more because a bright is a shorter bristle. There's a 7-Eleven sign here, and I just think it's really... Um, interesting, you know, because at first I was, I was thinking, oh, this must be Chinatown, like in Boston or New York. Um, but then I looked at the, uh, where the photo was taken, it was taken in Taiwan. And so I thought, oh, wow, that's so funny. They have 7-Elevens in Taiwan. So I thought that was just kind of neat. And um, I don't know, when I see, we don't have 7-Elevens up here anymore, but whenever I see one, I'm instantly reminded of like being a kid in the 80s and going to the 7-Eleven for a slush puppy. So I wanted to get that little sign in there. I'm just scrubbing out a little bit. Now I can see my paper pilling a little bit. Um, so I've never worked this wet on this paper before. So I guess you definitely want to be careful when you're using the um, uh, this paper not to get it too wet. I'm going to mix up my very pasty, my um, yellow and my blue. So it's a cerulean blue and it's a dye rod yellow or cad yellow or gamboge. And that's not going to travel too much. I just want to get the little edges. And it's okay if things look muted here because this is far away. And some people might want to leave this out. That might be like, you might not want that imagery in your picture because maybe you have a, you don't have a great um, association with 7-Elevens or you think it's, you know, it makes it look less, um, it looks too branded or less exotic or something. So, you know, that's your choice. You do it if you want to and don't if you don't. I'm going to keep it quite vague. I 
and now I'm looking for signs. I'm looking for things that I want to maybe indicate. Was there, did I interrupt you? Was there a question, Sarah, no. that came through? No. Nope. Okay. We're actually talking, <laughs> you said slush puppy. Uh-huh. They're called slurpees and other slurpees, uh, slush puppies. Oh, okay. Or I was trying to say, oh yeah, and I used to mix all the flavors together. Uh, blue was always my favorite. Yes, blue raspberry, oh, that was so yeah, good. So good. I remember in college, I, I found out how many calories was in one, and then I don't think I've had one since. <laughs> I can't remember. I think the last time I had a slush puppy, I was, it was pre-junior high. Um, Mimi, the pros and cons of single pigment and multiple pigment colors. Um, the pros of single pigment is that that's going to be the brightest color that you get. Once you start mixing pigments, you're, every time you mix two colors together, the result is going to be a color that's lower in saturation than the color previous. So you're never going to mix two colors together and make them brighter than they already were. You could make them lighter, you can make them darker, uh, but it's going to desaturate it a little bit every time you mix. So that would be the, the main downside to mixes, to multiple pigment colors. The, um, the good point about multiple color, multiple pigment colors is that it's convenience. Like say the color sap green, for instance, I love that color and I use it quite a bit. Um, so if I am out painting somewhere, if I had to mix that every time and you know, the lights changing, I only have 20 minutes, that's going to take considerable amount of time. Um, I'm going to use up my other colors faster. And if I just had that sap green, I could just use that sap green. So, you know, that would be the, the major, uh, bonus. Also, like it can bring the cost down. So if you're looking at student grade colors, rather than you having like cerulean blue, like I'm using here, which could be more expensive, they might have like, uh, they might use like phthalo blue and add a lot of white to it and get the cerulean, get the hue, get the tone or the color. Of course, it's not going to granulate or lift or have those properties. So that's a negative. But if you're a beginner and you just want that color and you're not sure how to mix it, um, then, you know, you've got that color. So I would say if you're buying tubes of paint, I would strongly urge you to get single pigment colors, unless you know, it's like a convenience color and you understand what colors are in it and why you want it. Um, otherwise I would get your single pigment colors. If you want to make a cer cerulean blue, you want a low tinting blue like that. that will have a little bit of granulation. Take your phthalo blue, add white, white will increase the granulation. Uh, so you can make it yourself. Knowing what pigments are in colors is wonderful because then you can kind of look at it like a recipe book. Like, oh shoot, Lindsay's using um, this color. How can I make it? I don't, or maybe like Daniel Smith Moon Glow. It can also save you from buying a lot of stuff. Like there's a lot of mixed pigment colors from Daniel Smith. And you know, if you read their, cat their catalog, it's like written like a romance novel. It just makes you want to buy those colors. But if you look at the pigments, it's like, oh, that's ultramarine and permanent rose. If I mix those together, I have, you know, moon glow or rose of ultramarine or whatever it is that they, you know, that they're, that they were selling that's a mixed pigment. So, um, so it's good stuff to know. Uh, Riska, Riska, uh, I enjoy mixing my colors from primaries. Do you recommend the Daniel Smith primary essentials set? Oh, I do. Absolutely. That's a, they, that goes with a split complementary set. So you have a warm and cool of each of your primary colors and you can mix anything you want from that. Absolutely. The reason you might want to branch out to other colors, because I know that's going to be the next question that somebody asks, <laughs> is because certain colors have properties like opacity, granulation, um, things like that, that can be very interesting in, in a palette, like I love burnt sienna because it's a little bit granular. It mixes nicely with other colors. It's very useful um, to mix an earthy brown. You're gonna need at least three colors and it's not gonna have as much texture to it as like a single pigment brown that you would buy um, and not mix. So, and also as like I mentioned before, even with a single, with like a, a split primary set like the Daniel Smith, um, you will mix a purple but yeah, purple's not going to be as bright as a single pigment like um, dioxazine purple, for instance, because you have two pigments in there and they, when you mix two together, it mutes a little bit. I mean, you can still mix super bright colors with that. Don't get me wrong, but you are going to get a little bit of muted uh, color there. Okay. So at this point, I'm evaluating what I want to do before it's dry. If there's anything else I want to add, if I want to add anything into any of these colors, wet onto wet. Um, something that I like to reserve to the end 
is using white. If I'm going to use white, I typically wait because if I add it early on, it's going to make things muddy. But on a scene like this, adding it in later can give us that foggy haze that we need in certain areas. Um, so I avoid using white a lot and I, and I recommend beginners use it very sparingly or, or use it with intention rather. I don't, I don't think there's any bad colors. Um, but if you are going to add white, it's good to add it towards the end because it just, um, it keeps you from kind of mucking everything up. Cause once you get white down, same thing with like oil paints, if you're ever painting oils and you're using white, you'll notice that white just seems to just devour every other color because it's so opaque and so pigmented and it just, it takes over. It will do the same in your watercolors. So I'm using this any place I want to glow. I want a little bit of a hazy glow, like on these lanterns where they are lit up. Um, I'm going to use them to help me get my lens flare that I'm going to be doing. And it's going to help me get that wet, hazy, misty look. Um, if I was painting a bright, sunny summer day and everything was clear and crisp or a bright fall day, I would not want to use white. I'd want to avoid it because it's not going to give me that atmosphere that I want. I can add some into my reflections. Because this will go over these other colors, I can kind of bridge them as kind of like a this glossy, hazy reflection going on top of everything and unite all these colors that I've been throwing down. I used to be against using white, but then I just saw so many, so much potential that I thought it was silly to, to not use something just for the sake of being able to paint without it. I thought it was smarter to use it more intentionally. Now that I've put those highlights in, I'm seeing that I really need more dark over here. I'm going to help it carve out those cars and then just kind of drag it up. So we've got these deep shadows towards the bottom of the buildings. Maybe we have doorways here, entryways to some of these buildings. If you have too crisp of detail somewhere, you can uh, spritz it with water. Stacy Brister, how would Lindsay, how would Lindsay mix something that looks like Daniel Smith's green gold, which is pigment yellow one two nine? Um, that's that is a uh, really vibrant color because it's a single pigment. That's um, azo green. Um, I would probably use lemon yellow and a little bit of phthalo green, just a little touch of phthalo green, which is a single pigment green, like PG7 or PG36. One of those two greens would work really well. I don't know what I did with my the scrubber brush I was using earlier, so I'm just going to use this. <clears throat> and I am going to, um, that's a great green to actually have. I'm going to put in my most dominant lens flare here. You don't have to do this if you don't like it, but I really like the way it looked. I kind of make it makes it I think feel like the viewer is standing like under an awning by a cafe like taking a photo of this I think that kind of puts you in the footsteps of the photographer a little bit something you can do and I, that that Daniel Smith mixing set was recommend was mentioned so I want to kind of touch back on that if you got that set um, and I can show you this remind me before we're done guys um, because in my swatch binder, I've actually done this. I took those six colors and I made a mixing chart where you make you, you know, mix every color together. And you can get a gorgeous arran arrangement of colors that way. And then when you need to mix a color, you can go back to that, um, that chart that you made and find the recipe. So you say, oh, I used um, Hansi Yellow Light and Thalo Blue for this. Or I used Cadmium, what do they have? No, Pyrrole Scarlet and um, Gamboge for this yellow. You know, you can find that information and it's so handy. And mixing your color does help develop your color vocabulary and you will be able to uh, have a lot more options when you're creating. It won't be any of this running to the store to buy a tube of paint because you're out of your favorite color. You'll know how you can improvise. All right, so lifting out gives us, us a very, very light, um, light look. We want to get some color into these and we actually can get some white into this. So this is fair. I think I'm going to dry it first before I do that. So I, so I can have some harder edges. I want the bubbles to be a little harder. 
So what I want you to do at this point, look at your picture, make sure there's nothing else you want to add before we dry it. I'm still thinking I want a little bit more shadow under these little cars. Jane Mulraney. I've only seen pads of watercolor paper, usual A4 size. Can you get pads of watercolor paper larger in the U.S.? Um, I've gotten pads, usually 18 by 24 is the biggest they'll come. And after, above that, I usually go with the sheets. Because pads are a little bit more convenient than the sheets. So I think if you were going to get bigger than that, you might as well save a little money and buy it by the sheet. Okay, something that can help you when you're doing something like this, it's a little abstract and you're not sure if you've got enough darker values in is that you could hold it up to a mirror or look at it upside down something like that just to give yourself a, a fresh uh, vantage point on it or just take a break let it dry naturally come back and um, and see what it needs I think you just a little bit of dark up here to pull your pull the design pull these build, buildings up higher so they appear a little taller I love this. It's so much fun, guys. I hope you try it. All right, let's dry this, and I'll take some more questions while we're drying. Uh, Actually, what is the difference between pigment and dyes? Okay, the difference between pigments and dyes. That's really tricky because um, pigments usually refers to the coloring, the colorant in your paint. However, that colorant can be um, a pigment or a dye. Generally, pigment particles are um, more light fast. They are um, heavier and chunkier and they're suspended in your binder versus being uh, d uh, uh, dissolved in the binder. And when you're looking at dyes, dyes tend to be in need of a mordant, which is a type of salt or aluminum, I think, that makes it, um, that makes it from fading and makes it bond to the binder. I'm not a chemist. Um, I highly recommend if you have really technical questions to check out the YouTube channel The Spin Doctor and the blog The Spin Doctor. I think it's Spin Doctor UK. Uh, it's a blog spot. It's um, he's a regular and this he comes to these chats sometimes, but he has all that information. But as I understand it, dyes need a mordant, and they can come from um, like plant sources. They can be synthetic, whereas pigments are mineral based, or they could be a synthetic pigment mineral based it's very sciencey I'm not 100% sure but generally pigments are referring to more heavier larger particles that um, are suspended in your binder where dyes are dissolved in your binder when you're looking at inks inks are all dyes um, like unless like unless it says like for for instance like P Dr. Peach Martin watercolors the radiants are all dyes they're very transparent and they're not light fast. Your Copic markers are dyes. Your water, your watercolor markers are dyes, except for a couple exceptions in the marker world. They're all dyes and they're going to fade. Um, artist paints, they will refer to those dyes as pigments as well as dyes because some of them are not fading and they're going to be light fast. But it has to it has to do with something about the I think how it's bound and what sort of if it needs a mordant. I think there's some chemical classification of which is which, but generally if somebody refers to a dye, they're talking about something that will fade and something pigment is something that will not fade. So I probably just made you more confused than you were before you asked the question, so I apologize. I like to flip it and dry the front and the back because it just keeps it, um, it evens out the tension a little bit better, so it's more likely to dry completely flat. Uh, Michael Ann, did you use white gouache or watercolor? I used wa white watercolor, but you can use white gouache. Now, the, you might say, why would I bother with white watercolor when white gouache is generally more opaque? Um, and the reason why is because white watercolor, like Chinese white, is designed to be mixed with your watercolors, whereas white gouache is designed to be opaque and to stand out on top of your watercolors. So when you use Chinese white, it's going to be a little bit more um, gentle and look a little bit more natural. And if you were to, um, and some of the colors that you buy have white in them, and it's generally a Chinese white so that it's, it can, it can dilute the color without making it completely opaque. It's, um, it's kind of like if you were painting with um, 
oils or acrylics is a white called a mixing white and what that is it's a it's it dilutes the strength of your color without making it completely opaque so you could still do glazes with it if you wanted to i'm gonna grab that chart real quick for you guys i apologize for the sound of the dryer and the furnace at least we don't have big machinery out there like we did this morning outside <laughs> i'm just gonna find my daniel smith swatch and you can see the obscene amount of watercolors that i have Oh, where is that guy? Right here. So what I did, this is the, the Daniel Smith Essential Set. Uh, Hansa Yellow Light, New Gamboge, Pyro Scarlet, Quinn Rose, and Ultramarine and Thalo Blue. So you have a cool version and a warm version of each color. And then what you do is you mix. You put them down one, you make a chart. Oh gosh, explaining things is not my strong point today. You make a grid that is the amount of colors you have. So there's six colors, so it's a six by six grid. So you put them all down the length of it and you put it across the top of it. And then as where the colors meet, you mix them together. And then it shows you the variety of colors that you'll get when you mix your colors. And I did a whole video on how to make a mixing chart a couple weeks ago. It's on my YouTube channel for more information. And then I did mix some neutrals over here by mixing three colors together. But um, it just gives you a nice idea of what's possible with the colors. Uh, that you can mix and what I usually do is whatever color is on the top column that is my most um, strong color so all the colors in this row would be more like that the Hansi yellow light um, and then everything in this row would be would have more new gamboge more pyrol my more quin rose and so on and so forth and then on this side the ones that are on the um, the rows across would have more of this color in it just to give me a variety because you'll see down the center you end up with all the pure colors and so then I like to have my top half to be a little bit more affected by this row and the bottom half more affected by this row I don't know if I did that on this one I think I did because like that that color is a little lighter than that color but it's just a nice way so that you're not just painting the exact same thing twice you have a little bit of variety but um, you can make some beautiful purples beautiful colors with this I highly recommend that set um, and you know it's really beautiful super duper quality watercolor too so if you have been on the fence about the expense of Daniel Smith colors um, you know it's the six colors you're absolutely going to use them up and you know lets you try them and then you can always invest in larger tubes as needed so what I'm going to do now is work on my little lens flare bokeh bubbles here. And I am going to, I'm just using a flat so I don't get too much paint. And also, because it's easy to keep a nice sharp edge. I want plenty of water so it's not very opaque. And with the um, white watercolor, you'll notice that it's going to dry more transparent. So don't freak out if it's like, oh no, I'm covering everything up. It will dry, it'll seep into the um, to the paper a little bit and it will let the stuff shine through underneath. So let's see, if I was using gouache, it would absolutely cover it up. The pigment particles in gouache are larger too, I believe, and that helps it sit on top of the paper rather than sink in and mingle with what's below. Got a little guy up here. And I got a little guy down here. While these are still wet, I want to add in my other colors. And I think I'm going to stick with a flat brush again so I don't have too much, too much water and color. But I'm going to go with a smaller one. And I'm going to pick up color from my palette if I have it and add water to it so it's about a skim milk consistency. And any of these colors are fair game because you would see them when you have any sort of flare like that or um, or glass or bubbles or anything that reflects light you you can grab any of the colors that you see nearby so I like to go with colors that aren't necessarily right next to it so that it can make it stand out a little bit more And this photo, I do have it linked up. It's from the website Unsplash, which has lots of beautiful, free, commercial use photos um, that photographers donate to the site. And you can use in your paintings. You can sell your artwork. You don't have to worry about um, copyright. You get, a, um, you get a little commercial license. 
when you use them there. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a great way for photographers to get their uh, pictures seen as well. I'm always so thankful for the talented photographers over there. If you're unsure about how much you want to add, you can always go back in and add more later. So, you know, you don't have to go crazy with it. I feel like it should have a little more red. The photo has more red in it. Um, I'll show you here. The photo has a lot more red in that, probably because of all the red lights. I really like that. So I think I'm going to do a little more red. I didn't in this one. I was a little more um, conservative with my color, but I do think I want a little more punch of red, especially in this one here. Keep it transparent though. This is a fairly opaque red, but you do want to be able to see through it. Okay, I'm gonna leave that be for now. And I'm gonna grab my pens. Now, one thing I know absolutely know I want to do is put some the little tassels on the bottom of my lanterns and give it a, give the lanterns a little bit of detail. I had the best luck with a number eight micron, 08 micron, um, which is one of the larger uh, tipped of the fine tipped ends. Um, it's about the same size as a sharpie, as like an ultra fine sharpie. So if you have that, you can totally use that. Sharpies might feather a teeny bit, but if you work quickly, I don't think you'll have an issue. Um, I am going to do start off like a kind of like a rectangle on top of my, I'm just going to pull that over there. I just got to be careful I don't put my hand in, in the paper anywhere it's wet. And I'm going to give it a little line to go up to the, um, the hanging, hanging string there. And then on the bottom I'm going to do little rectangle again you could do a trapezoid and then I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a swinging tassel because I like the thought of like maybe it being kind of a blustery windy day and these wires getting blown and the um, and the lanterns getting kind of jiggled and moved around and then I'm gonna put some ribs on it kind of like a pumpkin has and just throw a little bit of detail. If your paper is damp, you will feel a little drag on your pen and you might need to let your pen recharge. I'm just gonna move this so it's a little bit more comfortable for me to work. And I'm gonna do that on the rest of these. So if you guys have any questions while we're doing this, fire them away. This is pretty low brain power so I can actually answer you. There was a moment there I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can talk when I'm doing this. <laughs> this is taking all I got for brain power. And this is where you can be really expressive too. These the lines, um, these detail lines. You can be really sketchy and expressive. I think this would be a really fun style to sketch in if you were on location somewhere because it's you're capturing the essence of being there more than like a technical technical drawing. Uh, Pokey, how can I think you're gonna how can I improve scale when sketching a scene like this? Improve scale. Have something close to you, close to the viewer, the bottom of the page that's way bigger. And let your buildings go off the page at the edges on both ends if you can. And that's going to give you having that higher buildings off the page is going to make it feel like that's really close to you and really big. And then having shorter ones further away is going to show you things are getting smaller and, and further away. That's why our lanterns are tinier. They're just little spots when we get down there. Um, we're only going to detail like the first um, like the first row and a half basically. So that's going to help kind of sell the idea that this is closer and everything else is further away. Something you can also do is, um, the next time you're having difficulty when you're drawing your, your, uh, your picture and you're, you can't quite get it, uh, trace it. Put it up on a, against a mirror or, I mean, I'm sorry, a window or a light box, whatever you have, whatever you ha have handy to use and trace it. And then you can see how it actually is. Um, rather than, you know, drawing what you think you see, you may not be drawing what you actually see. Your brain could be giving you information that's not there and it could be confusing you. And then the next time you go to draw it, you're going to have a way easier time because you're going to know how it actually is.
I, I also you could take a piece of plexiglass or a piece of picture frame glass and set it on top of the like a computer printout and just trace it and wipe it away. Use a dry erase marker. You can get them at the dollar store. As I go in here to put this row, because I squished them too close together, I'm going to make sure my line doesn't go through these uh, these lanterns. I'm going to let it skip it a little bit. And this is up to you. You might not want to add this. You don't have to. It's still pretty without any pen. It's still pretty without any white. Um, I say if it improves the picture, um, if it helps say what you want to say, go for it. And then as I work my way uh, across here, I'm going to do less until all I have is just a couple little sketchy lines. And that just kind of helps all the other ones kind of fade and recede from us because they're, they're bright colors. Bright colors want to come towards us. Forgot to do details on that one. Um, and now I can look around and put any details that I want here. I noticed I forgot to put in my little hood ornament with paint. I'm just going to go ahead and do it here because this is kind of another focal point. This is the car in front. I'm just going to give, I'm not going to put any license plate numbers in. I'm just going to be very vague with it. I like how the colors flow into one another. I don't want to lose that. I'm only going to, it's like going to pretend that like uh, I'm charging you a dollar a pen stroke, you know, and then you only going to put those pen strokes and you absolutely need. Now this little sign here, uh, I'm just going to put some scribbles in there for writing. Even if I like wanted to copy the sign exactly, I wouldn't because I don't speak the language. I don't read the language. So there could be some like signs that say things that, you know, or I might copy it wrong and say something completely different that's offensive that would offend somebody. So I wouldn't want to do that with, um, with this. That's so why I'm careful with kanji, kanji or anything like that. Stacy Brister, my new Micron pen got something on it. Can I clean the tip with alcohol? You can try it. That would probably be the best bet because it will dissolve the uh, ink that's in there um, a little bit too. So it could help if it dried out even. Um, and Microns are disposable pens, but I do have a video on how I refill mine. Um, and, in, you know, uh, it's... Um, oh, I just noticed on the photograph you can see the reflection of the lanterns on the car. I think that's really cool. I don't know if I want to add it, but I just know I didn't notice that before. I'm seeing there's a reflection across the hood and across the um, windshield. But I think I'm gonna leave it I think I'm gonna leave it out, but that's something I never noticed. Yeah, it's so frustrating because sometimes all it takes is you're working in your art journal or in your sketchbook and you go over like something else, oil pastel or some other kind of paint that's not completely dry and then you mess up the tips and then it's it's frustrating because they're kind of expensive so it's nice to be able to um, to kind of give them a little new lease on life i'm going to move that red map to get easier to see that and now i'm going to go into the white pen again this is up to you whether you want to do it or not i'm going to go a little reflection on the car i did better at leaving my whites here because i had a, i started off with a drawing and i didn't on the other one so that really can help And on some of these bubbles, these little, or lens flare bits, I'm going to just trace it and then smudge it with my finger. Smudge it in towards the middle of the bubble. You can always do that with pastel too. If you are afraid to like, go in with more paint over everything, you could just gently with a little pastel do the same thing.
to get into t uh, Jenny, to get into tight spaces and layer in additional detail with Neo 2s, should I use watercolor pencils or colored pencils? I do have pit pens, but since they have wax, I'm unsure. Uh, yeah, if you're going over Neo 2s, um, I think I would use a really fine brush and like maybe scribble some of the watercolor crayon on your palette. Like what I have here, I just. Really, right here. I took an old plastic palette, not really old, but a cheap plastic palette, and I sanded it with a sandpaper. And now, if I scribble my watercolor crayon or watercolor pencil here, I will get a patch of color that I can pick up with a with a damp brush. That's what I would do because, yeah, if you go over it with a marker, um, you are going to pick up that waxy stuff, and it, it could damage the nib of your marker. So, uh, just a little spotter brush. I like the Royal Atlantic Fusion, and you can get those at most of your big box stores. They're a, a fairly stiff, springy synthetic brush that's excellent for that. All right. Well, I really think that that this picture is done. What do you think, Sarah? I think it is too. I think you could fuss with it more, but then you would do the over over fussing. Yeah, I do want a little bit of highlight in the top of these lanterns, I think, just cuz I I they're kind of a focal point. I think they're really pretty. I love Chinese lanterns. But I think that's, I think that does it. Do we have any other questions before we go? We're all caught up. Wonderful. Well, I had a lot of fun with this project. I hope you guys had fun watching it. And if you have any questions after the show, you can go ahead and leave it in the comments below. And I will check those out later today. Please give me a thumbs up before you, before you go. That really helps my channel. And if you're curious about any of the supplies that I used, all of that is linked up in the video description. Do you have anything to add? All set. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. And until next time, happy crafting.